And so, Father, we thank you for this time and opportunity to stand before your people. Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart, that they may be acceptable in thy sight. For, Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. You are my strong tower and you are my way maker. You are the wheel in the middle of the wheel. And, God, I need you the more right now. Here we are to worship you, God. Here we are to bow down because, God, there is no one else that's like you. And so, God, we pray that you anoint this, your word, that it may fall on good soil, oh God. The follow ground has been broken up, God. Everything that's unliking, I like you, God, has been driven out of this place, oh God. And so I have direct access to the hearts and the souls and the minds of your people. So move me out of the way and Holy Ghost have your way fall afresh on us and continue to rain on our souls, God, and we will bless your name, God. God, there is liberty in this place even now, God. There is joy, oh God, in this place, oh God. There is peace, God, that surpasses all understanding in this place because your spirit has chosen, oh God, to fill this room. And we thank you, God. We don't take your glory for granted, God. We don't take your presence, oh God. Your spirit dropping by in this place, God. We don't take it for granted, but we thank you, God for breathing in life. God, we thank you even now, Lord, for bringing strength, oh God, pouring out strength in us even now, God. We say thank you because you are true to your word. You tell us if we seek you, God, you add all these things unto us. And God, we have sought you this morning. And your God, you have already begun to add. God, you have already begun to add into us. And we thank you, God, those things that are spiritual, God, you've given us peace, joy. Oh, God, God, there is no law against those things. There's no law against faith, no law against love, no law against long-suffering, God. And you have already begun to pour out more of your spirit in us. And so our cups are filled with you. And so we long for more of your word. Because your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our pathways. So touch us with your word this, e this morning. And continue to anoint us for this time. We thank you now. And we praise you now. In the mighty name of Jesus we pray this morning. Amen and amen. Come on let's give God a hand and clap of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Jesus. If you got a reason to thank him. Let him know thank you Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Wonderful God. Wonderful Savior. Wonderful King. Wonderful Lord. Wonderful great I am. You are wonderful to me. Wonderful to me. Wonderful to me. Wonderful God. Wonderful God. And so what has become accustomed to our voices of praise, they have already got me into a good lather good moisture to be able to praise and magnify him and to expound upon the word. I thank you. I thank you. I thank you. That's that computer. I thank you. I thank you. And I magnify your name today. Turn with me quickly to John chapter 17. An awesome passage of scripture. John chapter 17, we'll be reading verse, verses 11 through 19. Many of us are familiar with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. That's what we consider to be the Lord's Prayer. But in John chapter 17, we actually find the Lord's Prayer. We have a high priest that has prayed for us. And in John 17, he breaks down this prayer that he has for his people. In verse 11, it reads, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. 
Those that thou gavest me I kept, and none of them I is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and thy and the word hath hated them. And excuse me, and the world has hath hated them, because they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so I have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. This morning, I would like to use for a subject or for a topic, prayer that makes a difference. Prayer that makes a difference. If you take any amount of time to navigate through the Bible, you'll find countless stories of men, women, angels and evil, even the devil himself having a conversation with God. Abraham spent so much time with God that his faithfulness was counted as righteousness before God. Enoch, he himself, the one that was not, he walked with God so faithfully that one day he was there and the next day he was not. David knew how to communicate with God so well that he was known after a man as a man after God's own heart. In Egypt, we see the prayers of God's people were heard as we see God delivering them out of bondage in Egypt. Even King Jehoshaphat, he he would not go into battle until he actually heard from the Lord. Um, there was another king who wanted to go into battle with um, Israel, but Jehoshaphat, or excuse me, with Judah, but Jehoshaphat said, is there a word from the Lord? And lo and behold, yes, there is a word from the Lord. Hannah, she prayed so fervently that Eli thought that she was drunk. Daniel prayed so consistently that his enemies used his faithfulness to prayer to try to entrap him and try to have him killed. God told Jeremiah to tell the people that they can call upon him, and when they called upon them, that he would answer them and show them great and mighty things which they knew not. Story after story we find in the Bible that people prayed, and when people prayed, God heard them. So it's obvious to me, if not anyone else this morning, that prayer must be something important for us, and it must be something important to God. And so as we exit the Old Testament, because all of those references were uh, about Old Testament um, characters, we enter into the New Testament. And as we enter into the New Testament, we find out um, that God had not communicated um, between, uh, had, had no communication between him and, the, uh, and man for over 400 years. Generation after generation had a prophet or a conduit to God. But when Malachi, after Malachi was completed, God didn't speak with the people for over 400 years. And any time we allow um, a disconnection or a lack of communication come um, between us and God, it grows a divide and a wedge between the relationship with the one who is the source of our strength, the one who is the giver of life, the one who is the one that breathes into us every single day, and he's the nourishment that we need. He he doesn't necessarily have to give us food, but he is a food as for moral for our bones, food for our souls, food for our spirit, man. He is the very source of life. And so when we find ourselves disconnected or out of communication with God, we are uh, detached from the vine. And anybody that knows vines, vines are a lifeline of nourishment to uh, the fruit that um, reside at the end of the vine. And anytime we're not connected to the vine, we lose strength, we lose courage, we lose hope, we lose our effectiveness when we're not in communications with God. 
And so in our scripture text today, after three years of ministry, uh, we find Christ's um, time on earth is quickly coming to an end. He's headed to the cross where he will die on Golgotha's hill so that we might be saved um, from our sins. But before he left, he had to get his house in order. And it's awesome to know that we have a high priest, a shepherd, um, that knows what he is doing. We serve the good shepherd, and any time the good shepherd has to depart, he makes sure that his house is in order. And so in John chapter 17, we find so much um, that God, that Jesus spoke for his people, and it can be broken down into these three sections. These are not my three points, but um, this is how John chapter 17 um, is broken down. Um, in uh, uh, the first set of se the first section, uh, we, he we find that Jesus being a leader uh, uh, is praying for himself. I have here that being a leader is often a thankless job. Uh, before we can pray for anyone, we must take time to pray for ourselves. You can't pour out strength into anyone. You can't pour out hope into anyone. You can't pour out encouragement into anyone if you have no strength and if you have no hope and if you have no faith in God, no hope in God. And we find today that too many leaders forget about taking care of themselves, um, that it causes them um, to not only to fail themselves, but it causes them to fail the people that um, they lead. But Jesus is different. Jesus, um, before he knew that he had to go to Calvary's cross, he knew that he needed to tap into the source of his strength, and the source of his strength was his father. And so he prayed for himself. He said, these words spake Jesus in verse 1. And lifted up his eyes to heaven. Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son also may glorify thee. He understood that he had to, uh, uh, the way for him to get to uh, God's glory, was fit, uh, it had to come from God. And that glory was going to be revealed uh, through his death and through the grave and for him rising from the grave and returning to glory to be with God on the right hand side of God. He understood that his glory uh, 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 was going to be about humanity, he was going to bring about humanity, that his death would allow our flesh and our blood and our, excuse me, our bones and our blood to go through death and to go through the grave and to be able to go directly to the right hand side of the Father. And so he glories humanity in his humanity, that he's able to take our flesh, that he was able to take our sins away and was going to be able to um, go to sin on the right hand side of the father so that he can make intercessions on our behalf in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13 it states for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities but was at all points tempted like as we were yet without sin his sacrifice will become his glory and him being obedient unto his father brings glory to his father so in the first section of this scripture, Jesus prayed for himself. And I pray that you all are praying for me as I pray for myself as I bring forth this message. The second section can be um, identified as Jesus praying for his disciples. The disciples were his family. They traveled with him for three years. They left their families. They left their jobs. They left their homes. They left all so that they would be able to follow Jesus. We heard this morning in Sunday school about the rich young man. He he didn't. He wanted to walk with Jesus. He wanted to be with Jesus. He wanted to follow Jesus, but he was not willing to lay aside and give away his wealth, those things that he was tied to, those things that he was attached to. He wasn't willing to let those things go. But these men, they gave away their all so that they can follow Jesus. And so Jesus needed to pray for those that were in his inner circle because he was going to send them to spread the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he notes here in, in verses 11 through 19 that uh, 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 he, these people were given to him. They were given to him by the Father. So it was his responsibility to teach them. It was his responsibility to feed them and protect them and to give them everything that they need that will come from the Father. Jesus gave them God's word and they received his word. And in John chapter 1 verse 12 it reads, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name. His disciples believe that he came from his father. And so since he came from his father, um, they would be his authorized representatives to speak his word in his place and in by his commands. But he was leaving them. But 
but Jesus wanted to make sure that those that will be left behind, those that remain, would not only be kept by God, but that they would be empowered by God. So the second section of John chapter 17, we find that Jesus prayed for his disciples. And then not only did he pray for his disciples, but he prayed for all believers as well. In the latter verses, in verses 20 through, excuse me, 20 through 26, we find Jesus praying for all believers. He prayed for them as it was a high priest-like prayer. Jesus prays for their unity. David declares that, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It, unity was something that was important um, uh, for us as believers so that we can become one. Um, when we're not unified, we're not as strong as we need to be. The Bible tells us that uh, God, one was set a thousand to fight, but when we work together in tandem, that means two can set ten thousands to fight. So unity was something that was important to um, the body of the believers. The world would hate them, and, and when they were unified, they didn't have to worry about uh, everyone hating them. There would be someone that would be on their side. There would some, be with someone with them that would not reject them as the world would do. But when they remain unified, the world would know that the father sent them and sent his son, oh God, uh, on behalf of everybody so that the believers would know who Jesus was. Uh, and so he prayed. He prayed for himself. He prayed for his disciples and he prayed for all believers. But our focus scripture today um, is focused on um, the second portion of this prayer that Jesus made before his father. He prayed for his disciples, um, though he specifically mentioned his disciples in this prayer. Uh, this prayer is actually for all those that would spread the gospel. For in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, um, Jesus urges the people to go ye therefore and teach all nations. So anyone that's willing to go teach all nations to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ, you are identified as the group that God, that Jesus was praying for in this scripture in John chapter 17. This, praise, this prayer can be a to believers today and show us the will of the Lord for his people as we journey in a perilous and um, a, a ungrateful and ungodly period of time. And so in verse 11, um, verse 11 and verse 12, he wants us, these are my, my points for this morning's message. In verse 11 and verse 12, it identifies that he wants us to be secured. Verse 11 reads, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep them through thine own name, those thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. These verses speak about the glory of eternal security that only God can give. Uh, that Jesus and God can give. With the spread of extremism, security has become a major factor in the political world today. But we as believers don't have to fear for our, um, our safety because we are being kept by the one that is the almighty. We don't have to fear our safety because God is keeping us. David proclaimed in Psalm 46 that God is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in the time of trouble. He goes on to say in verse 2, Therefore will we not fear, though the earth be removed and, and though mountains be carried away in the midst of the sea. I don't have to fear anything because God is my refuge. God is a present help. And so we don't have to fear our security today. Today We don't have to worry about um, enemy, the world trying to overtake us and overcome us as long as we keep our trust and our hope in God. So wherever we go, we need to walk around declaring that God is is my refuge and not only is he my refuge he is uh, my strength and he is a present help in the time of trouble that means that whenever trouble comes our way we still serve God the one who is our refuge and our help we whenever trouble rises up in our home we don't have to fret because God tells us he is our refuge and our strength a present help in the time of trouble that means when we need him he is there we just have to trust that our God is there. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. 
it reads, and we know we have been talking about First Peter uh, uh, in our Bible study. Verse 5 reads, uh, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. He keeps us. We, he keeps us, and he keeps us from all hurt, harm, and danger. We are his inheritance, and the inheritance that he gives us is not corruptible, but it's incorruptible. We are kept because we are somebody that's important, somebody that is precious to God. Turn with me to John chapter 10 and verse 28. John chapter 10 verses, uh, excuse me, verse 28. And it reads, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. That means you shall live and not die. Neither shall any man pluck them up out of my hands. That means that we are resting in the hands of God. Who can fight God? Whose arms can stretch, outstretch God? Whose arms can uh, take anything or muscle anything away from God? There is nothing and no one that can take us out of the hands of God. When we're in the hands of God, we shall not perish. So the first prayer that he prayed uh, for, specifically for these disciples, is that he wanted us to be secured. And when we are secured, that means we find ourselves in a place of safety. And I know you women that are in here, um, anytime you feel safe, you feel relaxed. But when you feel unsafe, you're not relaxed and you can't do the things that you normally need to do. As men as well, when we're not uh, relaxed, we're uh, insecure, we're not sure of ourselves, but in God, we can find our surety. In God, we can find our peace. And when we can find our peace, that means we can find everything that we need and more. God, Jesus himself, he prayed that his people would be secured. And he put them, and it's amazing that as he prayed for their security, he didn't pray for, he didn't come and ask for uh, 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 the nation of Islam to come protect them. He didn't ask for any security force to come protect them. But he put them into the hands of the one that had never failed. He was the one that was able to save the children of Israel out of bondage. He kept them from harm's way. He led them uh, with a pillar of fire by a night and by a cloud by day. He protected them. He allowed goodness and mercy to fall on them. So he led them. And he protected them from behind. He put them into the hands of the one that would never fail them and never fall short of his glory. He prayed that the people might be secured. And then in verse 13, John 17 and 13, he reads, it reads, and now, or Jesus proclaims, and now come I to thee. And these things I must, or I speak in the world that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. It's so often uh, during our time as believers that we lack the joy that we need to do the work that God has for us to do. The Bible tells us that we are many members of one body. And not all members have the same office, which means each and every one of us have an important task that God needs for us to fulfill. But if we have no joy, then it's hard for us to do the things that we need to be able to do. So Jesus prayed for his people to experience his joy, not just happiness, which is dependent upon circumstances. Some people are happy when they have a, a, money, a, a pocket full of money. Some people are happy when they get a new car. Some people are happy when they get a new house. Some people are happy when they get a new job, but when uh, the novelty of that newness wears off or when lack comes about, then they don't have happiness that they need. But uh, it's amazing that the joy that God gives us, the joy that's rooted in the Lord is a joy that cannot be ceased, a joy that cannot be taken away, a joy that cannot be put down because the Spirit is the one that brings about the joy that we need today. The saints of old would say that this joy that I have, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. Not materialistic joy because materialistic joy, it comes about with decay. But the joy that the Lord God gives, it brings about life. It brings about refreshing. It brings about renewal. It brings about hope. It's a joy that nothing can take away. His joy lets us be content when cancer may be ravaging through our body. His joy allows us to be at peace and give him praise even in the midst of a loved one passing away. His joy allows 
allows us to stare at adversity, stare at circumstances, stare at trials and let them know for God I live and for God I die and I will be able to find peace because my God is the God of peace. Joy that Jesus gives comes with contentment, and that joy is priceless. It's priceless. The world didn't give it, and the world could not take it or cannot take it away. Turn with me. Uh, go back to 1 Peter chapter 1, and let's read verse 8. 1 Peter 1 and 8. Whom having not seen, ye love, in whom thou, though now ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. He gives us joy that's unspeakable and full of glory. He gives us joy that helps us to walk right even in the midst of storms that are going on in our lives. We need to make sure that we find ourselves to be content in whatsoever state that we find ourselves in. That's quite impossible if you're walking in your own might. But Jesus, he prayed that we might have joy so even in the midst of storms we can have joy that is unspeakable and full of glory. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter uh, 1 Timothy 6 and 6. 1 Timothy 6 and 6. It reads, but godliness with contentment is great gain. All right, so we can gain a whole world but lose our soul. But the joy that God gives us, it great, gives us great contentment and it gives us great gain. So he prayed, he prayed, he prayed, he prayed that we would be satisfied, that we would be filled with joy, that we would be filled with the hope that we need to be able to go and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ to a world that was in desperate need to hear about that joy. And then lastly, he prayed for us to be, excuse me, not lastly, but thirdly, he prayed that we would be separated. Verses of 14 through 16, John 17, 14 through 16. And it reads, I have given them thy word. And the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. When you go through trials and tribulations, we need to stop praying, God, release me from the circumstance or release me from the trial. Because what's going to happen as we ask God to release us, he's going to honor our request. He's going to release us. But guess what's going to happen? We're going to have to go back through that trial and that tribulation again. Because it's a stepping stone for us, a stepping stone for us to go higher in God. He puts those things in our way and in our lives so that we can go higher. And when he removes them, that means we can't go higher. And I don't know about you, I want to go higher in God. So whatever he sends my way, I know that he has already given me the strength to be able to overcome and, and make it past every trial and every tribulation that comes my way. And so he says, don't take them up out of the world. Uh, don't take them out of the world. I don't want you, I just want you to keep them while they're in the world. Verse 16, they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them I'm going too far. They are not of the world. And so in these verses, he wants us to be separated. He prays that his people would be kept from the influence of the world and of the devil. He wants his people to walk differently from the world around them. It should be something we should be able to identify a, a believer um, from an unbeliever. And what's happening is we've allowed that mess to get into the church that the world that the church is now looking like the world. We sound like the world. We act like the world and we expect God to do something different than in us. But Christ prayed that we would be separated. That we would be different. That we would be a, a light instead of darkness. Everything that we do is going to be analyzed in the light of our Savior's desire that we be separated. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 6 verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 Verse 17. I didn't get to this one as quickly as I got to the other ones. Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 17. It reads, Wherefore come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean thing. And then he says what? I will receive you. He prayed. Jesus prayed that we would be different. That we would be separated. That we would be not like the world. And in Romans chapter 12 he says. And be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that you can present your body as a living sacrifice. Your mind has to be transformed. That means you can't think like you used to think. Your old ways can't be the same. If you want to be separated from the 
world, you have to turn over a leaf and not allow the word to the world to come into this sanctified vessel that God has made you to be. And so to aid in our fight with the flesh and with the devil, the Lord has provided all of the resources we need to be victorious in battle. He has promised us the ability to win over temptation. You can find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13. He also has promised us the ability to win over, to have victory over the the tempter. That can be found in James chapter 4 verse 7. And I want us to turn to James chapter 4 verse 7. James chapter 4 verse 7. I'm quickly coming to a close. This is prayer that makes a difference. I'm talking about prayer this morning that makes a difference. James 4 and 7 reads, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will do what? He will flee from you. So Christ prayed that we be separated. He says if we submit ourselves to God, if we submit ourselves to his authority, if we are obedient to his word and obedient to what he has told us, then we'll be able to resist the devil and he will flee. He didn't tell us to run. He didn't tell us to go hide. He didn't tell us to cower when the enemy comes. He told us to resist him. If we obey him, the devil can't help but to flee. And we need to be reminded that all we have to do is resist him and he has to flee. We have victory over the devil. And so Jesus, he prayed that the people would be separated, set apart for his glory, set apart for his honor. And not only did he pray that the people will be separated because it's a difference between light and darkness. There's a difference between holy and unholy. There's a difference between clean and unclean. And so you cannot mix and match those two things. Lady McCowan taught them in Sunday school this morning um, that if you had a drink, and I'm sharing with those that did not participate in Sunday school, that if you had a drink, um, that if you a uh, fly jumped on that cup or dropped on that cup or a, uh, a flew and landed on that glass, would you still drink out of that glass? Many of y'all, you would think of it. Some of us are nasty and probably would still do it. But if you think about the contamination that comes with flies, flies land on anything. They land on dead things. They land on trash. They land on poop. They land on a whole bunch of stuff. So if a fly lands on your cup, that means that that cup is unclean. That's just like God's spirit. God's spirit don't want to dwell in any unclean temple. So any little sin. It doesn't have to be big sin, but all sin is considered to be filthiness before God. And so he needs us to be separated so that we, he'll be able to come in and not only sanctify us, but he'll be able to rest and reign in our lives. And so in verses 17 through 19, it talks about Jesus praying that we would be sanctified, sanctified, sanctification. We're a sanctified church, so we know what sanctification is. When something is sanctified, it is made holy and is set apart for God's glory. Jesus wants his people to be purified. He says sanctify them through thy truth and we must understand that it's God's word that sanctifies us. It's not us living in our own way. It's not us just encouraging ourselves but David encouraged himself in the Lord. He didn't just encourage himself in himself. He encouraged himself by what he knew that God has done and so we find his truth. We find God's word, his truth in his word and it's his word that's going to keep us. And so he, he asked God, he said, God, please sanctify these people through thy truth. Don't let them become deceived. Don't let them become overcome by every wind and doctrine. But let them hide themselves in the truth, which is your word. Thy word is the truth. 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so I must send them also into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they may be sanctified also through the truth. This sanctification takes place through ministry of the word of God. You can find this in John 17 and 17 in Ephesians 5 and 26. As we spend time in God's word, it exposes areas in our lives. It's God's word that reveals when we have fallen short. It's God's word that tells us, oh, 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 man, I, I, something that I thought was okay. God just, oh, oh, God, your word just messed me up. It, it reveals everything that's hidden. And so as we spend time in the world, in the word, the word reveals things that needs our attention. When we hear the word, the word, our lives have to begin to line up with the word and we become more cleaner spiritually and of greater use to the master. 
And I don't know about you today, but I want to be a vessel that God can use. I want to be a vessel that's pure and holy, that's tried and true. I want to be a vessel that he would choose to dwell in. I, I want to be that vessel that cannot be discarded and thrown away. I want to be a vessel of honor, a vessel of honor, not a vessel of dishonor. Turn with me in my last scripture to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 through 21. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 through 21. He prayed that we would be sanctified because holiness without which no man can see God. We, we have to be sanctified. We have to be set apart for God's glory. And sanctification is just being set aside for the master's use. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. But it reads here, but in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. Jesus prayed that we would be sanctified. In verses 11 through 17, I mean 19, he prayed that we would be secured, that we would have security, confidence in him, not have to be fearful of where we had to go because he needed us to go ye therefore and teach all nations. He needed us to spread the gospel to every place in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And when we go there, he wanted to make sure that we were secured and protected and we would go in victory and we would go in his grace. And then he wants us to be satisfied. The, 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 the worst thing in the world is to be a disgruntled worker. When you have a disgruntled worker, you have somebody that's not willing to, that, that won't put all their effort into doing what needs to be done. If it doesn't need to go the extra mile, then they won't go the extra mile. If you tell me I got to punch that clock and stop at this time and you don't want me to work over, then that means I'm going to punch this clock at this time and I'm going to sit there and not do nothing else and go. You don't want to have a, a disgruntled worker. So Jesus didn't want our, us to be believers that are disgruntled. You know, we live in a life, uh, uh, live a life that is full of joy. We just have to find the right joy and have a right mindset to understand what the joy of the Lord is. It's not in material things. Those things pass away. But the joy of the Lord, he is our strength and he provides everything that we need if we find ourselves to be content in him. And then he also wants us to be separated. Not only separated but to be sanctified. Separated out of the world. Not of the world. We may be in the world but we don't have to reflect the things of the world. And the things that reflect the things of the world are unholiness. Um, unrighteousness just living, um, uh, 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 evil thought, evil maliciousness, and, and all the things that Paul was telling us before that we should not be counted, that should not be counted among God's people. We don't want to represent the world, so we should not look like the world, and we should be set apart. And when we're separated for God's use, then we're sanctified for God's use as well, and he wants us to be sanctified. Come on, everybody, resting on your feet. Prayer that makes a difference. Prayer that makes a difference. Prayer that makes a difference. He didn't pray that we would have riches and, and houses and land. He didn't pray that we would uh, 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 be the greatest among um, the world. But he prayed to make a difference in our lives so that we would be the vessels that he need for us to be.